Hello, my name is Barkha Dat. You're watching the Mojo Story. We are back on our reporting journey through rural India where COVID is lighting up the hinterland. And we may not have even felt the full scale of what is happening as we continue to bring you ground reports from across India. Now, as many of you know, my own personal journey has been well documented. Like so many other people, I have a tale of bereavement. I'm not unique in this moment. There isn't an Indian home who has not lost a loved one. I lost my dad and immediately after that I got COVID and after 16 days I am back at work but I am a living example of one of the big debates that is taking place in the medical fraternity right now and that is the use of steroids. I have been on dexamethasone for 16 days on my doctor's instructions. This is what is happening to many other people, even if their oxygen levels are not following. In fact, let's bring you the pictures of the drug that is at the heart of the current raging medical debate, where experts are now pushing back, saying that an indiscriminate use of steroids is actually causing people to reduce their natural immunity and also develop other infections like the dreaded black fungus. What exactly is it? On the other hand, given the shortage of hospitals, of ICU beds, of cylinders, many doctors are being quite understandably experimental in nature. They also come under pressure from their patients to administer some sort of medicine at home. And so comes the easy frontline prescription of steroids, which is now causing a huge and critical medical debate among experts. And let's bring these experts to talk about the pros and cons of the use of steroids, if we can introduce them one uh, by one now. Uh, we're joined on the program uh, by Dr. Uh, Rajkumar Mani. Uh, we're also joined uh, on the program, if we can bring her uh, bring her up now, is Dr. Rajni uh, Surinder Bhatt. Uh, we're also joined by Dr. Lancelot Pinto. Both Rajni and Lancelot have been arguing very strenuously against the indiscriminate use of steroids. Dr. Mufi Lakravala, who's been at the front line in Mumbai uh, of the COVID battle, is with us, as is uh, Dr. Sushmita uh, with Apollo Hospitals. And all of these are the best experts you can get on this subject. So I want to start with you, Dr. Mani, because by definition, what doctors are having to do right now is experimental, uh, you know, a lot of theoretical rules that you may have read up or that may make sense to you no longer uh, apply. So how often do you find yourself administering steroids? I think steroid is uh, one uh, proven therapy, life-saving therapy uh, for COVID. All the others, remdesivir is not really life-saving. It may get you to recover a little more quickly. And then other drugs uh, are not well proven. And majority of them have fallen by the wayside over the last one year when we used it in the first wave. Having said that, steroid is life-saving as well as, uh, you know, it's a double-edged sword. When not indicated, when it is used preemptively or at a stage when there is still viral replication going on and the disease is mild in terms of respiratory infection, then it is... It is detrimental. It's actually harmful because it can perpetuate the viral replication and it can actually aggravate the disease. But when we use it at a stage when there is a, a hyperimmune response, so-called overwhelming immune response of the body, then it is useful. But that's been well defined in the medical profession by current guidelines. That's useful in moderate to severe. In fact, best in severe disease those people who are on ventilators, but in moderate disease as well, you can use. What has happened is in current crisis and pressure situations, it has been extrapolated to include milder cases, milder forms, or has been driven by fear and instinct. And also sometimes uh, the, the need to do something, as you said. No, no, don't just sit there, do something. Many times in medicine, just sitting there, not doing something is the best course. But that course is more often than not, not resorted to. It may be due to the pressure uh, felt by the professional uh, himself or herself, or driven by family pressure, or by peer pressure, whatever it is. There's a collective thought that we have to give more and more, rather than less and less. So How the minimalistic that? approach is not popular. How how often do you find yourself giving in to that kind of parent pressure where people are saying, Dr. Saab, kuch to karo? You actually have resisted this pressure with antibiotics before. And uh, Rajini was saying, you know, we need to have a stewardship for steroids as well. 
I think what has happened is the steroid ship for the antibiotic has fallen by the wayside now, and there is no steroid ship, uh, I mean, stewardship for steroids. So it's a it's a situation wherein the crisis has produced a collateral damage to our psyches and our practices, which has only compounded the situation. So we have to stop and reflect and wait uh, and uh, understand what we are doing. There is no medicine, proper medicine, without precision and reflective action. You know, if we just uh, do it loosely, indiscriminately, injudiciously, we cause more harm. So it's always a, a, a business of uh, balancing uh, harm versus benefit. So that is very a basic tenet of medicine. Uh, Rajiti, what is the downside, right? And like I said, I'm a living example uh, of this. And when it was prescribed to me, even being an aware, well-read journalist who has spent 15 months covering this story, knowing the pitfalls, knowing my immunity uh, could go down. And I can tell you, I can feel the side effects. I'm wearing a mask, but if I take my mask off, my face is totally inflamed. I can feel the inflammation. I know it's from the steroid. But you know, at that moment when I lost my dad and I lost him in hospital and in my mind, the overwhelming emotional feeling was I do not want to go to hospital. So I just went along saying, OK, I'll overdrug myself. I think it's important for our audience to understand what is the downside of the way steroids are being currently administered in India's COVID battle. Uh Barkha, I completely understand the sentiment of someone who's been through a very traumatic experience uh, with hospitals and with the trauma of losing someone, having this fear of going to the hospital and therefore requesting for some measures which will help them avoid that. I have a few patients who have a similar situation. Uh, that being said, I think we can still continue to be judicious and responsible in our use of steroids. Um, even for patients who have, say, significant symptoms like persistent fevers or a lot of fatigue or who are worried about their blood tests and certain markers being high. Uh, all it takes is a really good uh, level of understanding of where their anxiety and their fear is coming from and explaining to them that uh, in order to, to uh, allay their fear of needing hospital, we don't need to give them steroids which may potentially cause harm. And we do know that in mild disease and in the early phase of the disease, um, early use of steroids is either not beneficial at all or in some cases potentially harmful as it perpetuates um, it, it allows the virus to continue to grow in our body, causing further damage. So I think it's really important that we stick to the first principle of medicine, which is first do no harm. Um, I have to understand the fear where you're coming from. And it's real. Uh, it's coming from a place of having experienced something that was traumatic. And you know, this isn't something made up. It's real. It's in your mind. And it's there in reality in front of us. So what I need to do is spend the time to reassure you, give you the parameters empower the patient with the knowledge that this is when steroids are useful for you and these are the potential harms. So then they become ready to accept your advice. It takes a little bit more effort and communication, which unfortunately, and all the hospitals, all the doctors are stretched to their limits. So time and patience is what has become in short supply. Dr. Pinto, one of the things that I know my doctor said was this will keep you out of hospital. And, uh, you know, and I and I went along with that. But I do know that I'm not the only one. Literally every single friend I have uh, who is battling COVID is on dexamethasone. Now, I think what's important to understand uh, is what is the harm this is doing? And in almost all of these cases, the oxygen did not plummet to any dangerous level. So I'm not talking about plummeting SPOs, but yes, blood tests were done where we were told, oh, the D-dimer is high, the inflammation markers are high, just get on to the steroid. So this is how a number of doctors, Dr. Pinto, are approaching this. Please go ahead with your concerns on this. So I think one thing we always need to realize is that inflammation is the body's natural attempt at trying to heal. And inflammation in itself is not dangerous. Inflammation in itself doesn't uh, usually cause harm. It's a small proportion of individuals in whom the inflammation takes on a form that is uh, that is way more vigorous, way more robust than it should be. And that's when that inflammation causes harm. That's when the oxygen levels fall down. So in the first week of COVID, most of the inflammation that's happening is actually a good thing. The body is trying to mount an antibody response. The body is trying to deal with a virus that is alien to it to form some sort of an immunity around it. 
Uh, and if you notice all over the world, about 80 to 85 percent of individuals will mount an immune response that is adequate to keep the virus in control and will be absolutely fine by the end of the first week or in, in a slightly longer period in some individuals. So dampening that immune response, which is protective, which really helps your body ward off the infection, is actually a bad thing. So if you give steroids at that point of time, because the CRP is high, I mean, the CRP was high because your body is really launching a good attack against this virus to try and keep it under control. If you go just based on that CRP and you try to dampen that immune response, you are indirectly aiding the virus. You are helping the virus multiply uh, without the body's so, immune response uh, being in play. So this is so fascinating because, I, like I said, I'm a living case study of this. And when I did my first blood markers, my CRP was high. My D-dimer was slightly uh, inflamed. My IL-6, you know, we, we all now know these things without really understanding them. And we said, oh, these are all inflammation markers. Get onto steroids. You're actually saying, Dr. Pinto, that that inflammation those inflammation markers is the body fighting the infection naturally. Now, one of the reasons that people aren't willing to accept that calmly is that one of the anecdotal patterns of COVID is a lot of people have done well in their first week and slipped in their second week. And it's it's been day seven to 10. So just when you think it's not so bad is when it gets really bad. And that's why people have been panicking and wanting a kind of instant embrace of the steroid. What is the most harm that the use of the steroid given early can do, Dr. Pinto? The, the thing is, most individuals in the community who prescribe steroids will see a significant proportion of them possibly do OK, because it's not that everybody who's on steroids is going to do badly. The thing is, somebody like me who works in a hospital, I'm at the receiving end where I get to see the harm, harmful effects of steroids. And unfortunately, we've seen it, especially in younger individuals. So younger individuals, because their immune response tends to be so robust, will mount a fever that's 102, 103, very strong for the initial couple of days. Now, a lot of them are put on these cocktails of drugs. Now, despite these cocktails of drugs on day three, day four, the fever tends to be 103, 104. They really panic because they think that things are going to go south. There's possibly some sort of a pressure on the doctor saying that, you know, you put me on a bunch of drugs. I've been taking it for three days. My fever still hasn't subsided. Uh, so this is the time you need to do something more. And that's probably when doctors add steroids. Now, what we've seen often enough, and of course, it's anecdotal because, you know, I can speak only about my experience. But I've seen a lot of individuals who traditionally would not fit in a high risk category. So young individuals, individuals with no comorbidities, who one would have expected to have this high fever for about four or five days and then settle beautifully after that. I've seen them deteriorate very rapidly and come to us with low oxygen levels by day six, day seven. Um, I have seen this so often enough that I don't think it's just coincidence. I, I think there's definitely a role. And if you look at other diseases, for example, influenza, which is another viral infection, steroids are not to be used in influenza. We know for a fact that steroids increase deaths in influenza. So it's not counterintuitive in that sense that this immune response that we want to fight is actually protective in some way and suppressing well, the on. immune response. Hang, hang, hang on, you've said something very important yeah. because one, we've all anecdotally seen many young people fail to battle COVID. You're actually saying that the early use of steroids is driving down their bodies natural capacity to fight COVID and that is what's making them slip. Whereas we all think of it the other way around. We think if we take the steroid, we'll fight it quicker. You're saying the opposite is happening. People are dying because they are losing their capacity to fight COVID because of an early use steroid. Dr. Pinto, is that what you're saying? Let's, let's put it this way, that if we did an audit of all these young individuals, of all these individuals who should not have died, and we looked in hindsight and see their patterns of prescription, I wouldn't be too surprised if a significant proportion of them got steroids very early on. Let's put it that way. You know, to make a causal influence and to actually say that people are dying before steroids because of steroids is a very strong statement. But I've seen I've seen enough individuals who, if you if they had seen me on day one, I would have said this is a young person. There's no reason this person wouldn't do bad, wouldn't do well. And then unfortunately, somebody started steroids really early, and that leads to a downturn of events. That's a big statement. Rajini, you want to join to that and then I'll go to Sushmita. You want to add to that? Yeah. It's a very good unmute? point yeah. about the early use of steroids causing the virus to uh, or, or allowing the virus to grow, um, have a free reign and grow in your body. So even if in a young individual, the early steroids do not lead to significant damage as in it's progressing on to in your lower respiratory tract into your lungs, 
if you are somebody who's able to mount an immune response where it stays a mucosal or just in the lining of your nose and throat what can also happen is you're going to be somebody who ends up shedding the virus a lot longer so you're going to become that person who's going to infect many many more people you might be shedding the virus for a lot longer all you need is one false negative test after that and you as assume that oh i'm fine i'll take my mask off i can read i can get rid of my isolation and maybe you go on to infect other people so it's not that you yourself are the one who's getting damaged or affected it could also be other individuals in the community who are affected by the early steroids given without the right indication to you so this is this is really scary it like it like it literally makes me feel i've handled my covid treatment all wrong at every step of the way but i think everybody's groping in the dark uh, you know uh, and there's so much panic dr sushmita what is this black fungus can you explain to us what is black fungus and what what does it mean and how much of it is related to the use of these steroids um uh, so basically i work in the hospital setting and i work in kolkata as you know uh, and so yeah. far i'm yet to see a black fungus although a lot of uh, you know talk of it happening in the northern parts of the country are coming uh, so it's basically mucormycosis which which is uh, a fungus which is an environmental fungus and usually infects those who have very 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 severely poor immunity and we previously heard of it in people with severe diabetes or who have who are severely immunosuppressed who would be affected by that uh, now lots of people um, are seen to have mucormycosis in the second wave the first wave we really didn't hear much about it and lots of people seem to think that it could be related to the uh, immunosuppressives that the patients are taking i'm not sure whether the two are related and whether its causality should be completely uh, put on the steroids but yes if someone is severely immunosuppressed they could have mucormycosis in most terms if somebody is affected by it and has low immunity they succumb to it what is your what is your experience practically not the theory but the practice uh, in in at what stage would you say take the dexamethasone yeah so um i have been speaking quite a lot um to patients personally as well as on media etc whenever we talk that the three phases need to be divided quite correctly the harm happened in the first the viral phase or the sorry the first wave of cells when the recovery trial said dexamethasone was a life saving drug that's when people started coding it and that's when people thought that this is one drug which is going to save me irrespective of what my covid in my body to get covid out of my body there's only one thing that is dexamethasone people started doing themselves wrong lots and lots of people as a rule i find are dishonest they will talk to you as a patient to a doctor but before they've even spoken to you before their doctors prescribe it because of the over the counter you know attitude in our country they would be holding dexamethasone and they'll start taking it with the first sniffle itself and then they'll talk to you and say doctor i uh, should i be taking a dexamethasone should i be taking a steroid when they've already been on it for 3 or 4 days and a lot of patients and educated illiterate patients will be doing it more and i'm being very very honest in saying that that it's my patients who are uneducated who wouldn't be doing this it's more the educated people who will be doing this around this time in the first wave as well as the second wave i always always tell people that the first 7 days of your illness if you take steroids you do yourself more uh, harm than good and there's lots of patients that come into hospital that have been taking dexamethasone from day 2 day 3 onwards either uh, after talking to their general physician or their physician or themselves and that's when yeah. they should be avoiding it completely just as lance said that if you take it in the first 7 days your viridia phase increases and you would be doing your body more harm in the inflammatory phase which is the second phase some people the first and foremost those who have mild illness even if they have ct evidence of small patches that is not an indication for steroids the indication for steroids is either your oxygen levels are below 92 or when you're walking it is dropping below 3% that and with in conjunction with your doctor's advice you started home patients should not be taking steroids by worry of am i going to get worse if i don't take it on time you don't treat x rays you don't treat ct we treat patients who are getting hypoxic whose oxygen levels are being affected and so every patient that has a patch on the ct should not be prescribed even in the second phase and that is for sure and how long should they be taking it 
we go by guidelines and we've seen that covid period has been such where publications have gone viral and publications have gone viral for the wrong way a little bit later this works and that doesn't work what's the right time how long should people be taking it we really don't know i because i work in a tertiary care hospital and i don't work in apollo i work in fortis now so um, um we find patients who are very very sick and when they go home even before they go home steroids are not just immunosuppressants they are the best anti fibrotics that we know in this disease and there we have to use them as anti fibrotics but only in a certain section of patients not all patients require it for 4 weeks but some patients will maybe even more than that but that's only a certain section of patients and it should be only people who are qualified to treat these patients for a longer duration of steroids who should be taking these decisions and i'm very very vocal about it not meaning any kind of disrespect but i think as um, the, the steroids should cease to be over the counter drugs they should be given only by prescription definitely in a country like ours where problems with it in the long term are going to be much more than the benefits that we see in the short term with covid so that that's really clear and as i said not just me but literally every single friend i have uh, is is the opposite living example of how we have been administered dexamethasone right now dr mani you were talking earlier about a lot of the treatment being experimental about even things that you know to be common sense not necessarily uh, being applied do you believe that we will see a paradigm shift in how these steroids are being used and i'm particularly stuck by dr pinto's argument that if we are losing so many younger lives it's not because of not enough steroid it's because of too much steroid possibly um you see i i tend to agree with lancelot uh, i am also getting that growing feeling that uh, we are doing over too much and uh, although the disease is taking away most lives there is a collateral damage as well and some we are losing to secondary infections or uh, to a prolonged uh, uh, you know viral process going on or to other uh, side effects of uh, steroids like uh, hyperglycemia that diabetes or fungal infections so however uh, i must say that steroid use has been increasingly better defined in the profession it is as, uh, as the recovery study showed that is not to be used in the mild cases even in the recovery study even those who are on ventilators had been given steroids only in 50% of the cases so it is not that we should be treating biochemical elevations of these uh, markers or treating a ct scan many times i have seen uh, the steroid use become very prolonged because the ct at discharge continues to show patches so we should use common sense the patches take time to clear it's not that they switch off immediately as soon as they get well i think judiciousness has been a part of the training in medical profession and this has to be the focus now it is not a sledge hammer approach at all it's a nuanced approach it we have to use all the basic principles we have been taught right from our student days when it comes to steroid we have to go by the guidelines and any deviation from the guideline has to be properly justified there may be a subset for which you have to deviate from the guidelines as sushmita said there are cases which have a perpetuated you know fibrotic process in the lung <clears throat> and those are small subsets what has happened is this has become a sort of a shotgun therapy for everybody we are no longer making indications precise and individualized so it's a uh, time to go back to the first principles that is in medicine panic? Even, even, dr mani is it being driven by panic i think even in the patient panics uh, the doctor should you know this is a discipline we must learn um uh, we should be of course approach everything from the heart but the cerebral side should never be weakened or get diluted so Rajni, we have to uh, rather focus on the information given and then yeah. alleviating the anxieties and taking the right decision rajni do you believe there is a larger environment to receive what the four of you are saying right because as you said most people are talking to their general practitioners they're not even going into hospitals meeting people the way covid is unfolding right now in our homes we're all being remotely managed by some doctor mostly our gps right who are who have this set piece you know there are all kinds of other medicines in the mix also whether it's an ivermectin or a 5e flu or antibiotics i mean even i can write out a prescription 
for COVID treatment now because there is just this formula of medicines that's floating around, right? We can almost all self-medicate ourselves uh, into this. Do you believe that ever since, let's say, the four of you have raised these uh, these alarms and these bells, is there is there an acceptance that let's hold this, or are people still pushing through with the steroids? I think wherever there are, you know, conscientious doctors everywhere are all in support of what we're saying. What we must understand is where is this coming from? It's coming from a place of fear, a place of fear from the patients that what if something happens and what if things get worse? It's coming from a place of fear and wishing to help from the doctor's side too. So the fear comes from what if something happens to the patient, someone's going to blame me that I didn't do enough. And that's an erosion of the doctor-patient relationship and trust that has happened over decades. And that's a separate issue. But the fact is, we're facing a crisis where people have less time for communication. All the doctors are overburdened. And when you have less time to explain the pros and cons of things, and you're dealing with a lot of anxiety and fear, the easier thing seems to be to do something. Dr. Mani mentioned earlier about do something, don't just stand there. And I think there is a very important role, especially in, in diseases which can lead to potentially critical mm -hmm. conditions as COVID can to don't just do something, stand there. And that's something that, you know, there's, there's a term for it. It's called zentensivism, where you actually assume a zen state e even, in, even in the midst of a critical situation. And that's letting your head rule your heart. It's, it's letting science drive you rather than fear. Sometimes all it needs is to understand that it comes from a place of wanting to do good for the patient, but just stopping for a second and saying that I must first do no harm. So I think it's important that all professional societies, not just pulmonologists or critical care medicine or the Association of Physicians of India, but every professional society issues guidelines and tells everyone that these are the boundaries and parameters within which steroids can be used for COVID because everyone is treating COVID these days. Dr. Pinto, do you want to speak to the black like fungus? You, you, uh, you can write a prescription for COVID yeah, now, you know how yeah, that is. Yeah. Dr. Pinto, do you want to speak to the black fungus uh, syndrome? So we've we've seen a few cases over the past year, and you know we've seen some. We've seen a couple in the last wave as well, and we've we've seen some in the in the present wave. Uh, I I think it's clearly associated with the duration and the dosages of steroids. At least what we are seeing. I mean, it's a small number, so we have to speculate. Uh, but it uh, you know if you use it in the way steroids are supposed to use, which is to be used, which is roughly five to ten days of six milligrams dexa. In a small subset, you may have to use it longer, but that's a smaller subset of the subset in which you use steroids. Uh, I don't think the incidence is is that high. The incidence is, of course, compounded by the fact that if you have underlying diabetes, you know, a drug like DEXA makes your sugars go through the roof. If you have underlying other immunosuppressive conditions like malignancies in the background, or you have uh, chronic liver disease or renal disease or kidney disease, you know, uh, you are more likely to develop it because you are already immunosuppressed. Add to that a prolonged course of immunosuppressive medications like dexamethasone. And the fungus is everywhere, right? It's a ubiquitous fungus. You and I are breathing it right now as we speak. It's purely a function of your immunity, whether it invades your system or not. Uh, so I, th I think, again, you know, this is, again, grounds for stewardship in terms of steroids. But this is possibly more related to dose and duration rather than timing. You know, it's not related to early yeah. versus late. It's more related to the dose and duration. Uh, uh, Mufi, if you, you know, one of the points that Dr. Pinto was making is that one of the reasons we are seeing younger people die is because they're losing their natural immunity to fight this virus because of too much use of steroid. Uh, I know that many doctors feel differently and many doctors have been administering uh, dexamethasone pretty early on, uh, not just based on oxygen levels, but also based on inflammation markers. Now, the debate here is whether those inflammation markers should just be allowed to run their course. It's the body fighting naturally. Uh, as someone who has advocated the use of dexamethasone, I know. What do you say, Mufi? I think we have to realize one thing is that this virus is killing a lot of people and we don't really have a cure. We, we probably have a very few drugs uh, that we have in our armamentarium. Remdesivir, if used in the early viremia phase, kind of decreases hospitalization, does not prevent deaths at all, like has been said pre previously on the show. Again, uh, dexamethasone, when to use it and when not to use it. The recovery trial has clearly shown us that if you use that at 6 milligrams and up to 10 days, it's a pretty safe drug to use. And it, I, I would 
doubt that it will ever cause mucomycosis or the black fungus. What happens is that some of these patients who come into the ICU are put on toclizumab, they are put on very high dose steroids, and then they are diabetic to, uh, to begin with. Now, if you're on dexamethasone, the most important thing is to look at your sugars. If you're not going to be looking at your sugars, I would say that because there, there's, there's a shortage of hospital beds, there's a shortage of consultants looking at this, I would say that in the smaller places where the villages and smaller towns where people are prescribing dexamethasone, they don't have the wherewithal to have a diabetologist back you or to do an HbA1c level to start with. And that's where things can go completely wrong. And then when they go wrong is that's when they continue the steroids. Clinical, along with uh, chemical parameters, like you're saying, the CRP, everybody knows how to interpret a CRP today. Everybody knows how to look at a ferritin level. And that's the big problem, that today, uh, most lay people are interpreting these levels without having a clinical base to it. For example, someone with asthma, I would not uh, be too uh, uh, too rigid about not starting steroids, either an inhaled steroid or a steroid, because that would help the person with the asthma as, as well. It's a respiratory virus. So the thing is, it has to be clinically monitored. And the most important thing is manage your sugars when you're on steroids. Don't give it more. But how than do you see how do you see this pushback? Uh, and uh, you know, Dr. Pinto, Rajini, Sushmita, even Dr. Mani, they feel that the steroids are actually coming in the way of young people fighting this instead of helping them fight it. You know, we've, we've heard that the cytokine storm, we've, we've heard, why are we taking toclizumab? Even right now, it's being prescribed in a lot of the ICUs. We, we've, we've been proven, the drug companies proven that it probably doesn't work. It's still that patients are running helter, skelter. We, we heard Dr. Mani previously say that sometimes you're forced in because the relatives force you. Uh, to kind of give a certain drug. So I think the timing of the of the steroid and the, the duration of the steroid is very, very vital. I think we should leave it to individual doctors to decide what is correct. If they've probably gone through all the guidelines by ICMR, by the state task force and everything, I think most of these guidelines are pretty sacrosanct and they're giving. The problem is in India, we do not know when uh, the actual COVID starts. The first two to three days, people are not even aware that they were they're positive. And then testing takes its own time. By the time you get your swab report, it takes time. So if you're going to count when your swab report result comes positive as day one, you've already probably missed five or six days. And so when you're starting steroid, you feel four or five days after that, it's already a bit too late or too early. So that's the important thing to judge when a person you think would have turned positive, but when is this contact? And today, because of the way it's spreading, you do not know when that person would have come in contact with the person who's positive. Okay, I need to take last comment. Sushmita, I'll start with you. Would you, first of all, even advise the blood marker tests that we've all done? Uh, or would you stick to the RT-PCR? Because the moment the CRP, IL-6, uh, ferritinin, D-dimer starts coming in, we're all in a basket of medicines. Certainly, as I said, I'm a living example. I think I've been having 30 tablets a day, literally, for the last 16 days. So, if the patient was my COVID, I wouldn't be doing the markers unless the patient's saturation levels were dropping or they were too unwell. A basic CBC and a CRP, which is done, is done in the beginning. And they would be only under clinical monitoring with basic, very simple uh, medications of an antipyretic, some vitamins and antibiotics for the first five days if they had bacterial infection symptoms. That's it. I wouldn't be doing their tests if they were at home. Yes, if they were hospitalized, then as per protocol, we would do the investigations as was required. Dr. Mani, this is not what's happening. I, I, I have personally had four sets of blood tests in the lab. I mean, I have to be a confessional in this program. I have done everything that is wrong. I have had four sets of blood tests in the last 16 days. I think blood tests will not save us. Blood mm -hmm. tests may actually uh, escalate treatment and be harmful. I think firstly, we have to consider what's the clinical context of doing these tests. So unless it's contextual, it's going, you're going to be all over the place and not knowing what to do. As Sushmita said, if the people are asymptomatic or have very mild symptoms, you don't need anything. You don't need the cocktail of 10 medicines, firstly. You don't even need an antibiotic. You just need an antipyretic. And all the zinc and vitamin C have been hyped up. You know, I don't believe in them either. Okay, Some people are giving vitamin C in very mega doses of grams and all that. They may have their own heart, which we have not worked out. So we keep it simple. Then if there is a high fever and all that, uh, then again, we reassure and ask the patient to be uh, measuring uh, oxygen. Now, oxygenation is good, all fine. But sometimes what happens is, enter the second week, 
suddenly a low grade fever becomes a higher grade fever there is sweating there is chills there is fatigue and even though the oxygen is all right you wonder what's happening so we do the markers and the markers if they are high you immediately assume it's an overwhelming uh, inflammatory response and starts steroids so this is i think where we are going wrong there could be secondary infection it has always happened with viral infections there are secondary bacterial infections in the upper respiratory tract or somewhere else so we have to carefully exclude other things and provide antibiotics before we jump to steroid therapy so i think these are basics of medicine which must kick in again in a pandemic situation because while we can help many people we can harm many people as well this we have to remember help and harm go in tandem and we have to sift the wheat from the chaff we have to be thoughtful individualized for every patient uh, mufi would you change your mind in the way that you've been using steroids given more experience that you've accumulated i i i completely i have yet to see any patient with 10 with 6 mg of dexamethasone undergo any of these signs that you we have spoken about in the show so yes i completely understand and like i said by the second week it's game over if you've already gone into a cytokine storm there's very little that we have in our momentarium today to save a patient i slightly differ from uh, what dr mani said in the point that if i was to be advising a government today and say that so many patients cannot be admitted to a hospital let's say we are doing a home care model where how do we differentiate between mild to moderate so that's when i would say that uh, when i was asked what kind of blood test you would do i would say let's do basic uh, a cbc crp maybe d dimer because a lot of patients above 50 already uh, we do know hypercoagulability is comes as part of this thing so whether to start a blood thin or not renal function test because which type of blood thin to start is important depending on your egfr so i would say do it at at zero day if you can do it somewhere in the middle at around 5 days and do it at 10 days if you are home monitoring because that might help you decide the trend in which you are going maybe then you need hospitalization before you've deteriorated to and you are not and you are not uncomfortable you are not uncomfortable with a small dosage of dexamethasone home administered even if oxygen levels do not fall i believe that if you are monitored well enough by uh, if you're not diabetic you're monitored well enough you will invariably see that you would probably save yourself from getting much worse and so i think this is a this is a devil in the deep sea scenario which one to take is is very important and whichever way you go it's like a glass half full half empty in medical parlance we'll always have advocates on either side who can argue the case very well but i believe that in this case where you do not want a patient to deteriorate to a point of no return i think a 6 mg of dexamethasone is not too bad If so who monitor. wants to take who who wants to take that on uh, uh, dr pinto Dr. Pinto or Rajni? So, if you yeah. if you look at it intuitively, if you look at it yeah. intuitively, you know the day before everybody's oxygen levels drop, they have normal oxygen levels, right? I mean, intuitively. Now, if you have strong markers, so you're into day eight, day nine, and you know somebody whose oxygen levels earlier were ninety nine have now started becoming ninety seven, ninety six, which does not meet that threshold of ninety five yet. but you're reasonably convinced that this is the second week. Everything else is going in the same direction. So the fever has come back with a bang. the person in general is not feeling too well usually accompanied by a relentless cough or a tightness in the chest if everything's pointing in the same direction i i have prescribed steroids when a person hasn't gone below 95 as well so i agree with him but but not in the first week not on day 3 day 4 for sure you know so and and a lot of thought gets gets put into before i put somebody on steroids so as long as you're doing your due diligence putting a lot of thought into it and then you intuitively feel that that's the right thing to do i i don't think that should be berated or that should be criticized but it there's a lot of finesse in making that decision that decision okay sushmita quickly and then rajni can have the last word yeah sushmita can we unmute sushmita hello yes go ahead what would you sorry what i'm saying I, i'm i'm saying that 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 there's one view that says a low dosage of dexamethasone administered at home without diabetes cannot do any harm in a situation where many patients are being home monitored do you agree no i don't uh, i de- definitely don't and yes if it it push comes to shove and there's no beds anywhere and the patient has been seen by a doctor and and deemed fit to have steroids then they should be given 
they that is where you know saving a life that's a very different scenario if that needs to be done then then you know it's a very different thing it's not science it's just saving life and its humanity again it has to be done with by somebody monitoring the patient how they are on dexamethasone but not just because they are at home only if their saturation level is falling and they are in the moderate category of uh, like the people you showed sitting outside yeah. that hospital yeah. in merit if it came to that and i was not working in a you know city sitting here smug and saying this should be done and that should be done and if i was working in a village and there was nothing else i could do and there was only something in my hand that could save a patient i would re- definitely need to do but if i had a choice and the patient could be admitted somewhere if they had moderate disease and i would assume that i was giving steroids because they had moderate disease they shouldn't be home in the first place but when push comes to shove lots of things need to be done to save lives yep a medical opinion remains divided and complex in a in environment of panic uh, i'll give the last word to dr rajini bhat go ahead ma'am that's so it. i think yeah. uh, there's there's a time and place for everything and we must put uh, these guidelines into context in terms of where we are in the course of disease with the patient and where we are geographically with the resources that are available to us we know that in the first week when the patient has mild disease and is not rapidly deteriorating is not having a rapid deterioration in all their parameters at that time oral steroids or systemic steroids are not indicated this is a group where inhaled steroids may be indicated and that's some evidence that's coming out in the second phase when there is inflammation going on and there is low oxygen we know that steroids are beneficial depending on where you are and depending on the availability of beds and home monitoring dr mufi mentioned home monitoring he didn't talk about indiscriminate use of steroids what he mentioned was very very pointedly about home monitoring for that right group of patients so i think in that set one can give it even at home otherwise it should be for moderate or severe patients who are in the hospital for prolonged use um i think again that's a very very small subset as dr sushmita and dr mani said uh where it comes to black fungus uh it is not as common and the kind of fear that's going around i think we need to allay people's fears as well that there is a certain background illness that the patient has when they are diabetic when they have low immunity due to many other things and you have indiscriminate use of steroids with high sugars unregulated that is the background in which black fungus becomes a concern we are yet to see the extent of it uh and that's the part that we need to keep in mind that the basics remain the basics remain front and center always the basics of medicine are clinical monitoring history and following the patient and not blood tests and ct scans and other investigation approaches well i well i can tell you that the absolute opposite of this is happening in most homes uh especially uh, i you know there's also a class dimension people who are in small villages like the one i'm sitting in they don't even know all this but for those of us who have the resources uh, we are obviously being trigger happy both on tests and medicines and and steroids and it actually really frightens me at this point that i've been on this steroid now for 16 days uh so i'm really in, uh, you know grateful for this conversation and i hope that we are able to remove rhetoric and emotion and panic which is natural for the times that we are living in from the heart science dr sushmita dr mufi dr pinto dr mani and dr rajni it's been a pleasure talking to you thank you for your patience and for your wisdom and i really hope that this starts a larger debate uh, in the medical community uh, i know you're all very very stressed as healthline workers so i really appreciate your time thank you so much and god bless you thank you bye bye thank you it's great to see you here thank you for watching our work If you haven't subscribed yet don't forget to click the bell icon and subscribe to Mojo Story and support independent robust journalists